Welcome everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's hybrid event, The Power of Data in Health. This forms part of the LSE Festival, People and Change, which is taking place from Monday the 12th to Saturday the 17th of June 2023, which explores how change affects people and how do people affect change. My name is Professor Ken Benoit, and I'm the director of the Data Science Institute at LSE. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome James Farnsham, Farnsham sorry, okay. Dr. Alex Gomez, and Dr. Angela Spar Spaparu to both our online audience and our audience here. I'm also very pleased, no I'm not. <laughs> it's been a week of festivals, let's just say that. James is a data journalist on the Economist data team in London. As well as writing for the newspaper's graphic detail section, he has produced original quantitative stories for many of the newspaper's sections, including stories about Britain's mortality rates and A&E delays. He joined The Economist as a researcher in 2009, and in 2014 was made the newspaper's first data correspondent. Alex is a research fellow at LSC Cities and a DSI affiliate. She is responsible for coordinating LSC Cities spatial analysis across a range of projects. She has strong interdisciplinary skills and is interested in connecting the different dimensions of urbanization. Her areas of expertise include urban policy, urban inequalities, urban health, sustainable mobility, public space, sensescapes analysis, and visual communication. Angela is a senior partner and EMEA leader, healthcare and life sciences for IBM Consulting. In this capacity, she leads IBM's teams across digital data and analytics across EU and other European markets. She spent over two decades working with health systems, public and private hospitals, insurers, and digital innovators on value-based care, digital health, and advanced analytics. So let me tell you about today's event. We're going to hear from our guests about the importance of health-related data as a resource to transform the world to transform the world for better and to save lives if effectively used by policymakers, healthcare providers, academics, and journalists. While we are rightly concerned about the misuse of our personal data, data science and the tracking of data will reveal crucial information and the impacts of change on people as the COVID-19 pandemic uncovered. Health and well-being must also be seen beyond the medical point of view. The space that we live in has a strong impact on us as shown in our festival exhibition Mapping People and Change. Each of our guests will speak for a few minutes on the topic before we have a discussion and take some questions from our audience. For our online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature. Please include your name and affiliation when you do so. We will try to ensure a range of questions from both our online audience and our audience here in the theater. For those Twitter users in our audience, please use the hashtags for today's event, hashtag LSE Festival. I would ask you to please put your phones on silence as to not disrupt the event. <laughs> this event is being recorded and hopefully will be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. So without further ado, I pass on to James, who will first offer some thoughts on the topic. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming uh, this afternoon especially on the hardest weekend of the year so far. So, um, yeah, I'm a data journalist economist, and I have been there since 2009. And for the past 10 years of, of basically been doing data journalism, which is, is not something that existed um, even 15 years ago. And so what does that mean in practice? Basically, I'm paid to, to research, to report, to analyze, to visualize, and write quantitative stories. And um, now I'm, I'm based in London, I've been based in New York as well in that time. And I sit on a team with um, eight data journalists and about 10 visual journalists. And there's a, a handful of, of front-end developers as well who do um, interactive visualization. So um, at the moment, I'm based on the Britain section. So for the past nine months, I've been doing Britain data journalism. And then for the past two and a half years before that, Basically, 90% of my time was dedicated towards COVID-19, so the biggest biggest story in the world since since basically March 2020. Um, and I always say that the data, as data journalists, data is our oxygen. 
And what does that mean in practice? It's not meant to be as a, a kind of um, bad health-related pun, but um, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking quite creatively about how to tell stories with data that other people haven't really thought about. And you know, because that's where your edge is in, in data journalism. You know, you want to kind of go, okay, this is something. This is a way of seeing the world through a prism in which it hasn't been presented to you before. Um, so I wanted to give you three exemplar kind of pieces, which I'm quietly proud of, um, that, that illustrate the, the importance of data and its relationship with health. So the first one is not a kind of straight back take on health. It's more of a um, it's it's from my time in New York, and it's the relationship between politics and health, which I think is really important. So. Uh, back in uh, November, cast our minds back to so November 2016, and the shock win of Donald Trump um, and his election to his victory, basically, and um, his his path to the White House. And this was a shock in part because all the prediction models that you remember, the New York Times, 538, and so on, were saying that Clinton had basically a 90% chance of victory. So the models would say, well, actually, you know, we said it was basically one in ten for Trump. You just ignored the one in ten, but he did win. And why did he win? Um, for the most part, it was because of this um, electoral group called what well, the Americans called the, uh, the non-college educated whites, which for us basically means white people without that didn't go to university, and they were really important in the election. Um, and where the models went wrong was to basically underestimate their turnout. So, um, and that was probably um, explained by non response bias. So where am I going with this? What we did was actually to go, okay, that's fine, we knew that, we expected that. There was a slight, you know, there was, there was a, um, a miscalculation in the model, but what else explained electorate behavior in 2016? And what we did is to look at the health. And why do we look at health? Because I was at a Trump rally in, uh, Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and um, Trump was, the, the weather was really bad, it was at this big leisure centre, his, his helicopter couldn't land, and so he was really delayed. I noticed at the back of the sports hall, there were all these, I mean, everyone was quite overweight, they weren't in the best, best of shape, but a particular group at the back of the sports hall, that even when he was speaking, could not even stand to hear him speak. They were so far back, and they had walking sticks, and they were all massively obese, and I was like, ugh. Oh, this is not so cool. So, like three, four weeks later, I was like, let's look at health. Let's look at the relationship with health and his and and the vote. And what I found was that an index of health metrics, so obesity, uh, diabetes, alcohol use, alcohol consumption, and physical activity. So an, an index of that of those metrics out explained um, his vote share relative to uh, you know, the other well-known ones, like non-college educated whites. Um, and even when you like, progress this in a model with age and education and sex, um, that these things were significant. So it was really important in that, in that election. Um, and that's not something that, that people readily knew. And it really highlighted the, the basically the importance of health in, in America and that, you know, you might think that actually these people were voting for change. They were voting for the, for the candidate who, who promised the world. So that's my first example. So my second example is, is more recently, it's COVID-19. And um, if we cast our minds back to the kind of early days of COVID-19, and no one really knew what was going on. I remember commuting into London, going to Covent Garden, going to my favorite coffee shop, and was like, it's weirdly quiet around here. I don't know what's going on. So, this was way in advance of any rumoured lockdowns or restrictions that were going to happen. Um, and so late that day, I was speaking with a colleague, Sandra Solstead, um, who later pioneered all the kind of excess death modelling and stuff and the global uh, totals. He, he's done wonders with that. And we were chatting, we're like, how do we try and measure behaviour in real time? Like, in a week from now, the world's going to change. In two weeks from now, you know, so, like, how do we measure this almost hour by hour? And so I remember, similarly, from my time in New York, being really reliant on the Google Maps. You go to Google Maps and you scroll down a bit to a particular location, you'll get this graph of busy times. And I remember particularly using this 
because I used to commute from work on like 46th Street through Van Central and then to cut through and then go up to Harlem. And so I, would used to, I used to look at this and go like, is Van Central meant to be busy right now? And so I thought, can we scrape this data? And the Google API does not offer, offer this up. So they didn't, you know, they provide a lot of data, which is great, but they didn't offer this up. So I thought, well, can we scrape it? And so I worked with a colleague many hours and many lines of code later, we were able to produce a scraper that picked 20 transit stations, undergrounds in, in the UK and so on, um, in 20 cities around the world, and to ping them every hour um, on an ongoing basis over the next week, 10 days or so. And when we aggregated that data, what we did find when we published the article was that indeed cities, as you might have expected, and was quite obvious at that point, cities were emptying out um, and behaviour was changing well in advance of any government mandates, restrictions, lockdowns, and so on. So that was super interesting. And I'd like to think that Google, in response to seeing that article, I emailed them several times. They were all like, oh, we, we don't know about this, et cetera, et cetera. But in response, a month later, they then uh, started publishing that data on an aggregated basis for kind of every city, every town um, around the globe. Um, and that became kind of the principal way in which epidemiologists would, would look at behavior and analyze behavior during the, during the pandemic. Um, and then my third uh, exemplar piece, which I'm quite proud of, is um, a piece I produced with my brilliant colleague, Georgia Banjo, and that was to look at declining life expectancy in the UK. And this is really, really well studied. And as a, as a simple hack coming into this, you go, okay, how can I advance the discussion beyond something that you know, much, much smarter people than I have, have like really looked into this really in, in great detail, um, particularly, say, Professor Michael Marner, for example. So what George and I did was to kind of go, well, how can we just represent this slightly differently? So what we said, look, we'll take life expectancy, and it's well known that life expectancy increased to the steady clip between 1980 and 2011, an additional three months a year, and then basically just kind of flatlined, and then, as you'd expect, COVID-19 sent it into decline. So we said, well, what if, what if life expectancy continued to increase? And what, was, what is that gap now? And that gap is 26 months. And then we said, OK, what explains this gap? So, well, the gap is, you know, the 26 months translates to an additional 700,000 uh, lives. So an additional 700,000 deaths. And some of those deaths can be explained by COVID-19, as you expect and also a slowdown which has been observed in, in Europe too. But if you strip those two away, you get 250,000 deaths, which are idiosyncratic um, to, to Britain. So, and that really highlights, I think, a, a broad attention to the, the importance of, of health inequalities. Um, you know, it's not London that, that where life expectancy is declining, but Georgia did a lot of reporting from Middlesbrough where things are really uh, grim and not too dissimilar to um, somewhere like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that I'd observed seven, eight years earlier. So those are my example pieces. Very good. Why don't we hear from Alex next? Um, so I don't have James' stories to tell, but I have some stories of someone who deals with data every day. <laughs> um, and I want to bring you um, a bit of my experience with data. Um, and I'm here to advocate for the importance of data. I'm not saying only AI data, I say crowdsourcing data, volunteering data, any data that we can collect that can help us measure spatial inequalities and how these spatial inequalities then influence uh, health. Um, and we can't understand the cities and how cities impact on society without having data. We are unable to gather evidence, to predict, to invest, to establish regulations and policies that influence health if we don't have good data. And while in the UK we are privileged, and every day that I work in the UK I'm like, this is so easy, and we still miss a lot of data. When I have to work in Asia or in Africa, the, the challenges are enormous. So just to give you an example, the census in Ethiopia is still the 2007 census. How can we plan for better health? in a country where we only know that the population uh, lives in a particular location because they lived there more than 15 years ago. 
So this, this, is, this shows us how you know, accuracy, how the level of detail, how the updated data is important when looking into cities. But many countries don't have, don't, have, don't have data because of wars. And we can see the case of Ukraine now. How can we help people in Ukraine reallocate, establish hospitals? You know, health is important, but we need data at each moment, and wars are creating a gap for that. And we could, we could see that in our resource urbanism project, when Kuwait was invaded and there was a gap between uh, two time frames on, on data. We, we have technical reasons, a lot of the countries, like in Ethiopia and other countries, we don't have the resources to create the data. And we have social and political reasons that are important when we look into uh, urban data. And in particular cases, and I explored a lot, uh, Asian and Middle Eastern cases, uh, for example, non-citizens data is really difficult to get compared with citizens data. In my hunt for data in the last nine years at LSE Cities, um, I had to use phone calls, personal networks, I had to use emails, desktop research, and I sent faxes. I don't know how many of you know what a fax is, but we still had to send faxes before COVID to get data from particular cities in the world. So for me, and when people ask me, what do you want to be when you're grown up? I always said I want to be a detective, and now I understand that I kind of am. <laughs> you need to get the clues on how to connect to people, to the right people, to give you the right information, to get the right data. So, you know, dealing with data is, is an adventure and it's almost being a detective. And just to give you an example, a very basic example, boundaries. And I think this is a great story for you. <laughs> how basic are boundaries? I'm not talking about, you know, only regional boundaries, country boundaries, city boundaries, but also small unit of analysis like the census. Boundaries don't match, often. Uh, boundaries are incorrect, often. Um, boundaries, believe it or not, um, they change. And just doing a simple analysis of how spatial inequalities affect particular cities or particular locations is almost impossible because boundaries are one of the hardest uh, data to get. And I do that every day at LSE cities. We often try to collect boundaries to show urban expansion, to show ur urban inequalities, and boundaries are damn hard. I had to draw them by hand once. So uh, how can we explore health and explore spatial inequalities if boundaries, which is the basic stuff because planners depend on boundaries, because health institutions depend on boundaries, they don't have the right data applied to the right boundary. Um, we explore health, and when you, when you explore health, we need to consider different scales. And nowadays, with climate change, we all know that you know, planetary scale is the scale of climate change. Climate change is affecting health all over the world. It affects regions, countries, cities, to the individual. But we, we can't forget that there's also uh, health at the national and at the city level. And for example, I did research in the Middle East, and car century cities, the fact that you're developing with sprawl and you're developing with low density because you have access to oil, you're developing in a way that you're stimulating car use and that creates diabetes, pollution and obesity. So the way we are developing influences health in a very particular way. And it's also important to look into the local scale and the neighborhood scale. And for example, when I was talking to Angela just now, in London, there's a 20-year difference of life expectancy if you go from central London to some of the extremes of London. 20-year difference. And for example, in Bermondsey North and Bermondsey East, which are connected, like literally connected, close to London Bridge, there's an eight-year gap in female healthy life expectancy. How data is important to explain this? How can this happen in a city like London? So that is, that is why I'm here to appeal for data. And not necessarily, I'm quite old school, I'm still not in the AI front, but you know, even AI will need some rules and regulation and instructions, and I think that is important to highlight. Now, even in a more local level, I want to talk about the 15-minute city. Everyone discussed the 15-minute city. There's all these discussions about it, all these myths of how we are constrained in all these locations. But I, I want you to think about the one-minute city. What's outside your door? How can you move outside your door? And I just broke my foot, and that is a, 
a problem that I, I recognize now. We are thinking about this 15 minute city and we're forgetting what's outside. What is in the nearby? How can we reach the, the shop where we buy our stuff daily? How can we reach the nearer cafe or the nearest pub? So the street level analysis is fundamental to understand healthy environments, uh, and in particular for vulnerable groups. And I have a project with the LSCDSI, with the Ordnance Survey and the NHS, and we had this amazing discussion the last time. And someone told me, you might have a pavement that it's 99% prepared for people with disabilities, but you can have a challenge that occupies 1% of that pavement that doesn't allow someone to move along that street. So data is needed to find that 1%, and that is one of the challenges of data. The other big challenge, and I think it's one of the biggest challenges, and I think the story is that James just, just mentioned, is that data links with everything, you know? Space is linked with health, which is linked with behavior, which is linked with families, which is linked with income, which is linked with so many uh, different dimensions. Um, so it's not only about looking into data, it's working together. Interdisciplinarity is very important when we look into spatial and social inequalities. Um, and for example, um, the other thing is to consider is that we often look into objective and easy measurable measures when we look into health, but we need to also consider what's subjective, what's emotional, how we link to different places, how what we see, what we hear and what we feel is important for how we use cities and, and how that relates to mental health. So, and that makes data even more hard to collect because we can all, AI can, you know, measure the number of people in a public space, but can AI understand how they are feeling? It's a bit difficult and it's a bit more tricky. Um, and so on the topic of AI, and because this is quite trendy, um, I think, you know, whether or not AI should be involved in modeling or predicti predicting data and these concerns of privacy, privacy and accuracy, I'll leave that to the LSE DSI and John Cardoso Silva, who talks about it a lot. I'm just here to say it's an opportunity that AI is providing us to generate large scale data sets, to create data, and to use innovative data visualizations that can extend beyond what we usually have, which is the permanent physical uh, buildings of the city. That is already mapped, but AI will bring us uh, the temporary, that will bring us the, what is needed, like the, the momentary, like what's happening with COVID. It's going to be much more easy if we use AI to capture elements that we never captured before. Um, and to, for example, to give you just an example, I was just in contact with a company who's trying to use AI to uh, create an index for accessibility for wheelchair users. And AI will allow that to be, you know, uh, enlarged and is upscaled from one street to the, the whole city. Um, and just almost finishing, uh, I want to say that along with data, we need to think about how we visualize data. So maps, how, how maps, how do we create maps? Are they simple? Are they complex? Do they tell the story? Do they represent the data accurately? Or do they engage with us? Or do we give up when we just look into it? And just to give you an example, I went to this exhibition once about data about one particular city, and most of the maps were quite misleading. So, for example, the denser areas were the lighter color areas, or, for example, green was used to represent industrial areas. And then I think we need to talk about data, and we need to talk about visualizations and go beyond the aesthetics. It's not only what looks great, it's also how are people looking into it and understanding what we try to represent. And just because we've been through um, two different things that are important uh, in, in, for different reasons, one is COVID and the other one is the, the heat wave we've, we've just been through, uh, through this week, I want to highlight that it's also important not only to share data, but to share maps and to make them available for the wider population. And for example, the mayor of London just launched the Cool Spaces of London map, where people can find shelter in, during the heat wave. So sharing data, sharing maps, and share, making that accessible for people can eventually help health. 
And, for example, during COVID, if it wasn't for the public loose map, <laughs> with everything closed, with all the pubs, all the shopping centers, I struggled personally. So having maps that give you what are the locations of places where you can just go to the toilet, uh, it's fundamental for mental and physical health. So I just want to finish and to say that data is vital for comprehending the impact of cities on health. As by gathering, analyzing, representing, and sharing relevant data, we can get, gain valuable insights into spatial and health inequalities, the effect of urbanization, the local factors that influence health, and the complex relationship between space and well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. <clears throat> and uh, last we'll hear from Angela. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, as Ken mentioned, I've been with IBM now for a couple of years and I lead the healthcare and life sciences team in EMEA. I'm part of the global leadership, so I look at a lot of the US and Asia and other data as well. Uh, before that, I was McKinsey & Company for close to 19 years, and in that capacity I worked not only in UK and EMEA, but I spent a lot of time in the US. I was part of the leadership of North America, I covered Medicaid and other national programs there. And I was also lead for Latin, for Latin American healthcare for them for a period. So I was reflecting on all that when I was thinking about what to tell you today, because part of the context always when you talk about data, and data in healthcare in particular, is there tends to be a lot of fear. What is the data? Why is it collected? What will it be used for? And for me, it comes back to the basics. Data is knowledge. Knowledge is power. Like with every power, you have to think how to use it. Who uses it? For what purpose? It, it is, in my mind, as simple as that. So if I take the Mexico, uh, LATAM, and Health and, and US examples of how I worked there, one of the first projects I had to do there was to look at the commitments of Mexico to the Millennium Development Goals, and particularly around maternal mortality. So we did an analysis of maternal mortality for Mexico. And out of personal interest, I looked at the US as well at the same time. So the US data were quite interesting because at that particular point in time, I think it was 2013, uh, the data might have been a couple of years back historical at that stage, but at, at that point in time, the state of Texas and the Republic of Mexico had more or less the same maternal mortality rate, which is fascinating because Texas is not a poor state. So that got me thinking, what actually drives this kind of outcomes? And then I looked at Mexico, and in Mexico we, we had a couple of reversals in the traditional thinking through looking at the data. Uh, the first one was, everybody thought that the biggest demographic related to maternal mortality were teenage pregnancies. What we actually found was that the biggest undetected and growing segment was women in their early and mid-30s who were obese, had other risk factors, probably had one or two children already, knew, they thought they knew how to be pregnant and work, were probably removed from the health system because they were hand-to-mouth in jobs that provided no security, they didn't follow up their appointments, and then they showed up at hospital seriously burdened, and by that point, they were hard to save in some cases. And that was fascinating. Like, the whole health system was thinking teenagers, and the group we really need to worry about at that point was a different one. The second one was, on a hospital-by-hospital -hospital basis, we did a, a sort of, uh, we looked at death reports, literally, which was pretty striking, and what we found that one of the most undetected things at the time was something called pulmonary thromboembolism, which is basically a blood clot in the lungs. I'm not clinical, but that's more or less what it was. Well, that was one of the biggest undetected drivers, that if women had it and had not been detected, could lead to a quick death. And that's something that, by looking at that data, we're able to offer back. So looking back, my whole team felt that was like the most worthy project we've ever done in a professional career in terms of actual impact. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to do in the next three minutes, I guess, sure. is to talk about, uh, briefly, about four things. So taking a step back, we, we heard some phenomenal examples, which I found really, really cool, I'd love to hear more afterwards. Uh, but what data do we collect in healthcare? What do we use it for? What is going well? And what is not going well or we could do even better? So these are the four things I'm going to cover and I'm going to do it briefly. So, healthcare is one of the most data-heavy sectors ever. If we do this right, we do it in a very fragmented way, but we actually collect data on people's habits, we collect data on critical disease indicators. So, for example, you know, somebody's you know, heart rate, blood pressure, um, smoking or other habits. We collect an enormous amount of operational data. So, the minute you walk into a clinical unit, a hospital, let's say, uh, from, you know, what did you present with, what were the precedents, what uh, medications or allergies you have, who saw you, what happened, what was the procedure followed up, who participated in the team, where the complications. 
What does this mean for your follow-up care? Eventually, you exit the hospital. There is data related to your recovery. You may have a chronic uh, disease issues. Uh, there is data around the chronic disease pathway. And then we also look at data not on an individual patient basis, but on a population basis. So we look at um, cardiovascular disease progression and correlation with different uh, types of um, complications, for example. So what do we use all that data for? First of all, we can massively use it to improve wellness. So if you think about uh, even the data that you know, your, your phones and your uh, uh, you know, uh, watches and so forth collect, you can use this data to understand your sleeping patterns, your eating patterns, your mood, and how this correlate in a way that you think, how can I be my best self? Not insignificant. In fact, there's a phenomenal amount of this investment going to exactly this space. Uh, you can use data to predict. Uh, so some of the great examples from, the, from Israel, for example, from health management organizations there over the years, they've collected data that allows them now to predict at population level, individual level, different types of cancer, particular colon, and so forth. So you can do some phenomenal amount of work there to address individual needs and population needs. You can use data to personalize care as you come into hospital. You can use data to personalize medication. We're developing more and more personalized medication, which reduces side effects and increases efficiency for any medication we're going to be getting in the future. It gives us the opportunity to put the patient at the core. It's very important to not be supply-driven, but be driven by the patient at the core. So I'm the patient, and there is data about my well-being, my mental health, my you know, um, civic you know, background in the urban environment where I live, uh, my emotional or employment condition. There is all this data that can help the health system if they see me as a single person, as a unit of interest, as opposed to a fragment of my data, to actually really improve my life. So all of that, I think, is phenomenal. And then a lot of the operational data actually allows the system to plan better. It allows to say, we're going to put a hospital here. It allows to say, we need more doctors or nurses of that caliber or of, of that uh, you know, level in this location. It allows us to actually address one of the biggest issues, and that's actually where AI can help. One of the biggest issues in healthcare today is the workforce gap. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will know, but the WHO announced that by 2030, at the global level, uh, we're having something like an 18 million gap in healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, and others. 18 million people who we have not trained. And that is at the point where disease burden and need is actually increasing. So we're nowhere near addressing that. And knowing where the biggest gaps are and what we need to train and how to actually excite people into healthcare, that's one of the biggest challenges the system faces today. I was at the Kim's conference in Chicago in, in April, and literally that was top of mind of all the chief execs across countries. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up, I know you get an uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 I think I touched a bit on what we use it for. What are we doing well versus less well? So we are starting to collect that data on a connected basis. So in this country, as an example, we're collecting now data more on what they call the integrated care system, which is across healthcare and, and the health and the care sector, the social care and different systems in a particular patch area. That can be a half a million to one million population typically. So the first time we're looking at this data together, we're creating population health initiatives. We say we really want to crack, I don't know, obesity rates in Middlesbrough. And then we go after that and we invest in that area and that has the biggest impact on the system and in society in the next you know, 10 to 20 years. So we do, we do a lot of these things very well. What do we need to do better? Uh, first, uh, and that's me talking, not in official capacity, declutter. We actually collect a lot of data. That creates burden on the system, that creates burden on people who need to supervise the collection of the data, or even maintain legacy systems. We actually don't need all that. Get back to the basics. What data do you need for what purpose? The, the famous use cases. And then use that data well, and then redefine the information gathering system around it. Um, second, um, be clear on the value story. What is the value to the individual, the city, the society at the local level, the society at the national level? So why would people agree to share data and under which conditions? We need to be very clear of what is the value and then create and communicate the narrative of value. People are not stupid. If there is value, they will be happy with it. But you need to tell that story. We need to upscale the front line. There is an enormous amount of data and what I hear from physician friends quite often is, there's all that stuff, I don't know how to use it. I need a report on X, but I don't know how to make that report happen for me. And the people in IT have a lot of work, they won't do it for me. So upscale people to use the data to be self empowered users of the data that I think is quite important. And last but not least, um, trust and openness. So there's a lot of people who want to use your data. There's very few people who should. 
you do need to work with organizations, public or private, that really convey that trust, that are committed to trust, that are committed to openness, that are committed to using data for good societal purposes. Or if they're using it commercially, in a way that's a win-win for society, and that is okay, but you need to know that. Uh, and openness, open architecture, open source, you cannot, no one can at this point predict what the needs of the system will be in 5, 10, 15 years. So if you don't have an open, interoperable system, you're stuck. You're stuck paying people license fees for the next two decades who you don't need to pay really. It can be cheaper, better, more effective, and flexible to your needs. So trust and openness is what I would ask for, and I'm closing here. Those are great four principles to close on. I think we should enshrine those perhaps in some tablet for all data, not just <laughs> <laughs> so I completely agree more with you on those four points. Great. Well, we've got a lot of material that was presented by our panelists, and I'm sure that the audience has some questions. So why don't we start with our, um, our physical audience, and we can also pay attention to the online question. We have a question over here from the gentleman. We'll bring you the roaming mic, and if you could please, uh, please just state who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, my name's Ewan Grant. I'm, I'm now a journalist, but I used to be a law enforcement intelligence analyst. So quite a lot of my work was involved in analysis, interpretation, and indeed prediction. Um, in my broadcast, I did predict Putin would invade. My question, um, two quick questions. Given the points about clutter and legacy systems, which have certainly seen that, are there any particularly, particular categories of information which have pretty universal impact in that everybody recognizes their importance and is trying to do something with and about that information? And secondly, um, why didn't the dog bark? Are there any organizations getting very uneasy about the work of the Sunday Times on the Wuhan um, situation? Are there any organizations you think that don't want to hear data or reporting on the possibility of a lab leak? In other words, what happens when information, if true, may not fit an agenda? Well, who would like to address? Um, and I can talk to the first one, I guess. Okay. The second one, I'll leave to the journalists. <laughs> um, so, yes, so in healthcare, in uh, healthcare systems, I think there is a pretty good understanding at the moment of what our priority on an ongoing basis uh, on different categories of data. In fact, a lot of executives would look at what they call a balanced scorecard, which will give them a, a balanced scorecard, they call it. They would give you a sense of different types of information uh, related to the healthcare delivery, from operational, what input did you need, what uh, people's time and so forth, all the way to you know, uh, what, what happened to a particular patient. Uh, now, um, it depends on which part of the system you are with. So if you are in primary and community-based care, the kind of information you need to collect is very different to someone being in an operational environment in a hospital. Um, I could give you a lot of examples, I mean, this is a particular area you're interested in, but the one that I think is changing fast and for good reason, well, two things. First is the connection between hospital and non-hospital data. So collecting data on the patient across the pathway or across the lifespan of the patient uh, related to how they access primary care or community-based care, are they getting support from social care, etc., etc. So getting all that information in place is extremely useful. And the second one, which is linked, but I wanted to flash out a bit more, is uh, mental health data. Uh, the connection between mental health uh, comorbidities to physical comorbidities is a very, very strong one. I did a piece of work in North East London, actually, a few years back, on diabetes and on complex elderly patients. And one of the biggest uh, predictors of how they were likely to develop as patients were actually the prevalence of anxiety and depression, which in, in that population in that time was somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. So if you do not understand that connection, you cannot progress further. And then, of course, mental health on its own, even with that connection to physical health, is an enormous, enormously important issue. So these would be the two I think I would prioritize. Okay. 
James, you want to take a stab at the? Oh, uh, I don't. I don't have strong. Theory. No, I don't have strong priors in the lab leak theory. Um, I kind of switched off from it some two years ago. Testing itself is very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's largely an academic question, insofar as like the the pandemic happened. It was really shitty, and therefore. You know that the, there was this virus. We we dealt with that and we're, we're over it. In terms of like the politics of the WHO and to what extent they interrogated the Chinese, I don't know about what the Sunday Times have been doing. I wasn't aware they were pioneering uh, coverage and whether that was inconvenient or not to the British government. Is that what you're suggesting? I don't know. Uh, rather, another government much further. Right. Last week, last Sunday's uh, insight. It's a rather long and detailed, and I suspect we, we, have, we may hear more stages. I, I do okay. notice that in his book, he wrote it in the alone. Tom Clancy always used to put two phrases. One of those phrases is, why didn't we do that? Right. Yeah, uh, I'll have to look at the article. Um, but it's, it is interesting in a kind of background question and what we can learn about the future. Um, and obviously we don't want future lab leaks, so if indeed it was a lab leak. But biosecurity aside, I'm not an expert on biosecurity, so, um, but yeah, largely faded into my into the background of my mind. So. We have a question back here, just if we could take in the mic, um, and we'll come to you next. We, one of the issues that highlights about uh, trust and openness is the public understanding of science is, let's just say, unevenly distributed. And sometimes facts are presented that would be completely uh, quotidian to a scientist, but to the public, it seems like a revelation. The idea, for example, that um, these viruses are being engineered in labs. Yes, they are, because that's how they're studied uh, in order to defeat them. Um, so trust and openness come with also a sense of responsibility among journalists about how to present this in a way that won't alarm people or misrepresent the nature of what's happening. And what I would add as well is that I'm not a representative of the, of the media. <laughs> I'm, I'm my own individual, and I'm not, I'm not even here as a representative of The Economist. You know, so my, my healthcare co uh, colleagues, who, you know, healthcare experts within The Economist would be thinking about this far more deeply than I am a mere British data journalist who has to think about mortgage interest rates this week and so on. So, um, so it's, it's, that's why it's in the background of my mind, too. So just as a slight well, caveat to what I said. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Harjit Sandhu. I um, used to be a health professional. Came here to the LSD to do health economics and policy. And now I'm um, the managing director for an association of eye care providers across the UK. Sort of two questions um, about the producers of data and then the users. I think with the producers, what I find when I'm sitting with NHS commissioners and peers is we're not, um, data's becoming more beautiful, the output, but we, the models becoming more complex. And it's not always clear those producing them are working within a scope of practice. So when you're a healthcare professional, you work within your scope of practice, you know when to stop. Whether you have views on what we can do to make sure those presenting data to us work within their scope of practice, and then for users of data, how can we get more honesty in the room? I don't understand. I honestly do not know whether I can trust your graph because I don't understand the model. Um, does that make sense? Is that too? It'd be interesting to get your views on how we improve the supply side and honesty on the user side. Do you understand everything you buy? Do you know exactly how your car or your fridge works? No, but I think there's, I think there's a difference. I think, I'll give you an example. When, when we're in rooms, in rooms where we're discussing the commissioning of services and there's inferences made about even waiting list data and what you can infer, there's very strong inferences where I don't think we challenge each other as much as if we were making the same inferences about patient care, where there is maybe evidence-based data. I just think, I, I'm always honest, for example, about my lack of understanding of the model. Um, people assume that I'm very good at data and I'll always say, actually, no these people are much more capable, and it's about that on the um, user side, but on the supply side, some of the models are so complex that if you can, so when nice producers a complex model, you take it at face value because there's an institutional structure around it. 
when you get it from a different organization, a third party organization, a lobbying organization, how do you get the user's support to better understand the model? Does that make sense? So I'm not saying that you have to understand everything. I'm saying there's a, as data becomes more complex, there's a bigger information asymmetry. Yes, no, I, I hear you, sorry, Kat. You need to be able to trust who the, you get the data from, in particular, as you say, as there is increased complexity of the model. So, I mean, I haven't worked with IBM, but I'm sure other companies are exactly the same. What uh, large companies tend to do, they have a very extensive uh, quality uh, excellence departments who come in and audit your work. So the work that I put out cannot go out like this. It's effectively almost like a scientific panel inside of IBM that will check everything I do, will check my approach, will check the deliverables, will check that what I'm saying is correct, quality assured, and does not pose a risk to my organization or the ones I'm serving. And I'm just saying that as an example that I know, but I'm sure other companies are doing the same. Uh, where it gets interesting is when you work with um, smaller organizations or some very, very exciting startups that may not have gotten to the same level of institutionalization of the risk and quality processes. And I think it, it pays to be closer then and try to really understand their processes because frankly they're building it and you know, hopefully they'll get it right, but there may be some more risk in that particular process. Lobbying organizations, um, it's, it's in the world, right? Uh, so you need to be extremely careful um, where they drew the information from. Uh, in previous uh, stages of my career, I had worked to create reports for organizations that end up funding something. But the, the premise always was they were funding, not editing. Right? So you can work for the whatever association or on a particular topic, but you need to understand the people who work for them created a report that was funded, not co-written, not co-edited. If it is co-edited, then you do not know where the bias starts and stops, and then the risk is on you. Alex? Yeah, uh, well, I don't work directly with data health, but I work with urban, urban data. And one, one thing that I find important is collaboration. It's very interdisciplinary, working with data. And, for example, I don't trust myself to analyze data, for example, of Kuwait without talking and having someone helping me from Kuwait. Because how can I look for an answer if I don't even know what are the elements that I need to highlight? So I think along with uh, the, what was discussed before, I think collaboration and interdisciplinarity can help people understand data, how to analyze it, how to read it, uh, and how to use it. Do we, uh, I would see some questions here, here, and here. I think we have you next, but we, let's see if our online audience would like to pose a question, which will be posed by Rosal. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a question from Varad Rajan, who's a prospective student in Mumbai. And the question is, uh, during my regenerative farming and soil health data, it was hard to come across reliable data points from good sources. Uh, how can students find data with the little contacts that they may have, and also differentiate between reliable and unreliable sources of data? Easy question. <laughs> this one's for you. I, I can, I can go. Yeah. Um, uh, so basically, I did research about Delhi, and there is a lack of access to, to data, but in, in particular if you're outside uh, the context. And we had researchers in location to try to find the data. A lot of the data, and that's why I talked about the faxes, a lot of the data was collected through phone calls, through conversations, through engagement. Because the data doesn't exist sometimes in maps, I mean, in, in, in reality, that's something that can be shared, but it's in the knowledge of someone, or it's in a particular report that only one person knows. So a lot of the times, you have to be a detective to get to the source you need to give you the data. Regarding accuracy and, and not accuracy, that is a tricky question, because a lot of the times, you don't have data. So. Do you use data that you, you don't think is reliable? I don't think so. But depends a lot on how, you know, if that is something that just gives you an idea of some, something and it's not impacting anyone, then maybe. But I wouldn't trust um, sources. So what I do often is I cross over. I have one source. I look for other sources and I try to see if they match, if there is a consistency. For example, when I look in, and this is a basic thing, like transport networks, 
I find one map, and then I find another one, and then I find another one, and then I try to see do these maps match, and the boundaries, the same thing. So unless you have a way of crossing over and checking the reliability, I wouldn't trust it. This is a really key issue we face across a range of data sources, and one of the challenges is um, different definitions nationally, cross-nationally, are very different. And one of the reasons trying to estimate COVID deaths, for example, people didn't rely on national statistics was because of different definitions, and also misreporting or underreporting. So that's why, uh, for example, James was referring to a way of calculating excess mortality versus what would have been reported previously, assuming those definitions didn't change, that gap could be coded. Um, and another one, sometimes people make honest in mistakes due to limited systems. Mm -hmm. We are catching up in the public sectors across the world uh, in ways that are sometimes embarrassing. And there was a story in um, COVID reporting here in the UK where different regions were sending in Excel spreadsheets by email to a central statistics office, and someone noticed that the maximum uh, number of reported cases seemed to be 16,384 yeah. because they were using a really old version of Excel and that was the maximum number of rows. Can I just say something else? Jim, very quickly. So, for example, you have a lot of illegal, illegal immigration that doesn't respond to census. And census are meant to be the most reliable source. Of data, so even that, you know, you have to consider that maybe you should also cross over with other sources to just understand where people live, for example. That's right. Data, data recording sources are not neutral; there are biases built into them. We have to understand those too. Anyway, we have some questions. We'll go back to our our audience here. Um, uh, my name is Emily, and I work for a publicly funded biotechnology company that deals with a lot of data. Um, <laughs> And I basically, I have a question, Angela, about something that you said at the end there of your introduction, which was that openness and trust. And my question is, I, I understand where you're coming from with the point of view of openness, building trust when you're being communicative and telling people about what's happening and what you're doing. But I think you were alluding to a more technical example. And I just would like to hear a little bit more about what you mean in terms of being open with your technology, um, because I feel that in building trustworthiness, a lot of the fact that we are so locked down in our tech and our data is what makes people trust us, because they feel like their data is, is safe in our hands, whereas if we were more open with that, I don't know what sort of impact that might have or if I misunderstood you. Yes, so thank you. I, I think you're touching on two very interesting topics that are connected but not exactly the same. So there is open access to the data, I guess, and then there is open architecture, which in my mind are two slightly different things. Uh, I was talking, first of all, about the open architecture side of things. So there are providers of technology solutions in any space, healthcare or otherwise, that have developed certain systems that in the past would operate in a world of its own. They would deliver certain results in a certain way. And a good example in the past would have been you know, some types of electronic patient record systems that hospitals would have. So if you don't emphasize open architecture and what you put in place, you get locked into certain architectures that have legacy implications. So some of the stuff we're using in this country was developed in other markets for different systems, and they reflect some of the thinking and needs of those systems, which we don't need here. So they're heavier, more difficult to use, and can, for example, uh, create a, a longer process for adoption, which means a hospital will not adopt them well, etc., etc. So there's a lot of complications that way when it comes down to the actual architecture and the type of openness of the solution. Is it flexible? Can it be adapted to your future needs and integrate data sources and other players as they come into the market as the system progresses, as society and your needs progress? So that's, I think, quite important and hopefully not, not disputable in itself. Now, how we use the data, uh, there is, I think, a huge priority right now in the NHS and more broadly around being transparent on how you use the data, but very, very robust governance and security around the use of data. So a very good example now is we're starting to federate data from different parts of the NHS in a way that means you create a layer where people can come in and use the data, but don't actually take it out, if that makes sense. So the data stays within the original system and the owners, but, but people, for example, who may be researchers under certain permissions can access certain types of data. And there is an audit trail. You can always see who used the data and for what purpose. Now, of course, as a buyer of these solutions, 
as the health system, you need to be clear that there's no back doors. You need to really understand the security and governance implications of that. But we know how to do this. We've been doing this in security, in defense, in, uh, you know, in banking, like financial data. It's not like we don't know how to do this. People know how to do this. So you just need to insist on very good governance processes rather than have this kind of diffused fear of how things are being used, if that makes sense. Did I answer both your questions? Yes. <laughs> or, or rather, I made it two questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. I was definitely on the sort of open architecture angle, but um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Just um, the gentleman earlier talked about healthcare models, and I've been a, a, a practitioner in the NHS for almost 30 years. Um, but one of the things um, that's always amazed me is why we introduce new models of healthcare with a view to reducing waiting lists when there is no actual evidence to support that because they're theoretical models or they have been, the data has been tried in a different setting, for instance, in the general population, not in primary care versus secondary care, and yet it's, yes, it, yes sort of maybe due to lack of knowledge or understanding of healthcare professionals and, and managers, they adopt new models. So I wanted you to ask you, sort of perhaps take a, a previous question a bit further, because in, in medicine we never try a new model of care for a patient unless there is evidence to support it. And the second question I have is about intersectionality and ethnicity and low socioeconomic status, etc. How do you bring that data? And you mentioned yourself maternal mortality. Of course, in, in this country and in the US, there's lots of data to show, but I think in the UK, it's, um, the mortality rates are double in, if, you come, if you're black, for instance, um, in mothers. So um, I'm just wondering how you handle the intersectionality of data and whether it's being, you feel it's being collected properly as well. Some big questions, <laughs> who would like to take a stab at that? Um, okay, so uh, your first question on um, uh, the changes to the model of care and, and what this means. Uh, and, and I'm glad we have someone who's from the health system directly here because uh, you know, this is the kind of input that we actually miss most, most of the time. Um, I think one of the biggest issues we face trying to use data is that for quite a while data was somewhere else and not really as linked to people delivering care and, and being fed back you know, the right insights on how to use, what, what are the issues you're trying to address and then how to actually address them. I think this is improving right now. Uh, you see in many places, in many, well, in the trusts, in the ICSs, in many parts of the system, you see multidisciplinary teams coming together with much more leadership from clinicians, nurses, and others coming in and giving them this kind of steer. But I think for, fundamentally the, the only way to deal with that is to make sure that people dealing with data in a very generic capacity, that maybe data scientists who don't know healthcare or other sectors who just deal with data in whatever way, uh, can be in, informed by that. Um, I, 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 one of the interesting, fun examples in my life of working with a hospital in Spain at some point is that actually we fielded a team of data scientists to look at their data, and they were looking at productivity opportunities in operational theater in different conditions. They included maternity. I had to step back and say, you know, that's not like, like a hip operation. You know, <laughs> you actually cannot predict how long a labor will go for. It's very basic, but they lack that kind of context. And if you don't bring the people who understand the system into the data discussion, you won't have that. Your second point about intersectionality, I think that is a big priority, not in all systems. The NHS, it is. Um, it is there's a lot of data is collected on population health uh, in different parts of the system. My organization and others, we did an audit of the population health uh, the data and uh, digital capabilities of all the ICSs in the country, all 42, in the last two years. So people understand who collects data well, what gaps they have, how are they actually using it. And then the priorities at the ICS level are to reduce inequalities in a particular area, whether it's a population or, or other segments, uh, whether it's an ethnicity-based uh, sort of segment or another type of segment. And I think that is becoming increasingly a priority. So, so the mechanisms are there, but it's definitely much more work in progress as population health analytics uh, develop further. Does this answer your question? Thank you. I think we have time for one more very brief question, if we can keep our answers brief, too. Thank you. My name is Christine Chow. I work for a institutional investor, so I have the chart. My, my day job is to talk to companies and probably have 
talk to some of your colleagues. Um, my original question was about federated learning, but since you mentioned that you collect federated data from NHS, I'm going to ask a follow-up question based on what you have mentioned earlier, which is that, um, is that the main source of your federated data information? Um, or as we see that the whole digital health value chain has been expanding because there's more digital health app, and you mentioned the importance of location and mental health. It means that data actually comes from all sorts of location and, and channels. And how do you ensure that the federated data that, in a way for those who are not familiar with the term, it's, it's one way of protecting data privacy of patients, or if, if I may say so. Um, how, what are the pitfalls that you have seen from, from the startups that, that do not have as robust a risk management process that you mentioned earlier? And uh, what can you advise them to do to make it better so that they're more prepared to be able to provide high quality health data that is also have data privacy embedded for patients? Um. I'll try to make this brief. I'm conscious we're on time and there may be other questions as well. But uh, a data federation is happening. I'm not saying it has already happened. So it, it's one of the things that's been planned in the NHS today. I think you're absolutely right that having data that comes from different parts of the system, different parts of the value chain is fundamental. And one of the things that the NHS is putting in place right now is actually a marketplace to link to the data federation, which will allow different innovators, uh, you know, UK startups or other organizations, to play into that field, to access data in a different way, and to access the market uh, and create more innovation across the system. And you know, support the UK PLC as an innovative force in data and health um, in the years to come. So this is all very, very much in line and I'm very, very connected. Now, um, startups, I mean, uh, I work with several and they're doing a brilliant job, to be absolutely candid. Uh, I think it's just one of these things is that uh, you always, I, I find it very exciting and rewarding to actually be in coaching roles related to startups and be on, you know, connected to advisory boards and other things. And I think just for the startups, reaching out to people who are already in the system and getting that kind of advice every step of the way is, is probably a good practice. And the ones that I've seen be very successful in the health space right now, I think traditionally they do that. So they understand very early on what it is that they do not know and try to bring these capabilities in. Can I just say something? Um, just talking about uh, health and data, and I think that's also for, uh, for you. I think it's also important to look into social sciences and relation to data and analysis and data science. Because social, sciences may, social scientists may come and they can ask, why are these black women dying more than... So the, the connection between the interdisciplinarity and the collaboration, again, of the different, different uh, sciences that are involved in, in studying health, I think it's fundamental. And that's only when people ask questions, then the scientists can produce the data and can try to understand why these are happening. And I think also for urban, for health data, we need to understand what's be, be, before that. What is creating these issues to these women? Why are women going to the hospital? Or why are, uh, if, why are these health inequalities <coughs> happening? So I think the, thinking about what's before, but also thinking about collaboration and interdisciplinarity is quite important in the science. Well, we could ask questions. I think all afternoon and our excellent panelists. Unfortunately, there are more parts of the festival for us to go and enjoy. And I think that's an excellent note on which to end. Um, you need a mixture of knowing the domain to which data science is applied and also knowing data science and the data in order to be particularly effective. That's one of the ways that, uh, that's one of the key things that we try to do at the Data Science Institute and at the LSE in getting more and more into data science. So I would uh, encourage you to uh, keep studying both your domain and the technical aspects of data because as the world becomes more complicated, we can't let ourselves become more simple. We have to upskill and understand that complexity and understand data because it's a part of our world that's not going to change. Thank you very much to our speakers and to our audience, both online and in, in person, for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. And um, we uh, wish you a great weekend.